All right, welcome to everybody that's here today. A nice size group we had. Thanks to uh, Mary and Joyce for the abundant uh, table of treats for us. And later on, Dia will give our uh, uh, prayer. Um, speaking of birthdays, Janelle has one coming up this week. So happy birthday. And I actually had one last Saturday, so oh, I'm a year younger. Yeah. 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 I'm starting where I'm going downward in, in <laughs> age rather than yeah, well. <laughs> Right. Uh, welcome to our online folks as well. Oh, is that the 9th? 10th. Oh, the 10th. Yeah. The 10th. So if you'll bow, I'll just do a quick word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, that we have this time to come together each week and do this in-depth in-depth study of your word. Help us to really incorporate what we learn into our lives and to share it with others as we go about the rest of our week. Be with Deanna, give her full recall of all the things that she wants to share with us. And just thank you so much for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I need to turn this Switch off. It All right, good morning. How do you switch it off? Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our second lesson in our study at the table with Jesus, where we will be studying the Gospel of Luke through the table passages. Um, today we're discussing Jesus's dinner at the home of Simon the Pharisee. Um, but before we get there, comments on what stood out to you from last week? The many different um, connotations that table can have, protection and blessing and provision Okay, the meaning of table. What does it mean to us? What are the connotations? How does it affect us? So provision and blessing. And what else did you say? Protection. 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 Okay. And then fellowship, right? And right? different kind of tables where we gather. Different kind of tables, but always there is that sense of solidarity, of connection, of, of togetherness. Yeah, absolutely. In, in our, what we've been reading for today, inclusion. Inclusion, yeah, we talked about that. How radically inclusive was Jesus to just pick out a tax collector? You know, that I think we lose the shock value because it doesn't hit us in our culture the same way it would have hit them in their culture. But um, how audacious of Jesus Christ to just walk up to a tax collector and say, follow me and include him in the community of the faithful. Yeah, he take home with you. Take it, and then he goes home with him. Yeah. Right? Yes, that and solidarity. He on the other people he has called. Now that's a big uh, deal for people to have to have come to the house of Matthew, the tax collector, who they who was bleeding them for money. Okay, so we have two sides of those people, right? They're the tax collector who tax collector gets to have friends who are tax collectors, right? That's who we'll associate with them, right? And so, yes, we have the people that are in already in solidarity with Levi, we think is Matthew. Um, and those people are included by Jesus too. That's a big deal. And then to see the people who are not tax collectors. There are maybe they're disciples of Jesus. Maybe they're following Jesus into that home. And so are they willing to include Levi and his tax collector friends? And we see the Pharisees and we wondered, are they looking in from outside? Are they really in the dinner or are they judging from afar, right? Are they going to go in the house of the tax collector? And that was the question. You know, the question that was left hanging in the air from Jesus' statement. Well, what question was left for those tax collectors? Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the right, not, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So what question is left? 
Who were the sinners? Right, and is is each person watching? Am I going to claim to be healthy, or am I willing to repent? You know, and so we talked about that radical inclusion and the call to repentance out of last week. Oh, guys, you guys are a good summary maker. You did good. And we also learned that Jesus taught at each meal. Okay, Jesus teaches at each one of these meals, and we're going to see him do it again today, aren't we? Yeah, we talked about how we're going to cover all 10 of these meals, and I said a wrong number when I gave you the <laughs> overview last week, so let's do it again. I know, right? Yes, horror. Um, so we have seven meals during Jesus' ministry, three in the region of Galilee and four on the way to Jerusalem. Then we have the, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. And then we have the two meals after the resurrection, the road to Emmaus and the community of disciples. And so that's the 10 meals that we'll be going. So if you we're keenly adding up my numbers. I think I said only six on the road and that does not add up. Okay. So, um, all right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so today, so I had you, we're in Luke seven thirty six today. But I had you read a much bigger section, didn't I? Because we're sort of looking at Luke, and there, there are multiple ways to look at biblical literature, aren't there? We can look at it from a certain person's point of view. We're, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the table ministries, and all of these other stories have threads that tie in. But if we were looking at it from just the healing stories, then we would need to look at the table stories and see how those tie in. And so there's all these connection points. Today, we're going to go over three stories that set the stage for the meal story today. And then we aren't going to have time to do the stories I had you read after. Um, so, but if you, if you um, meditate on those, you will see how all of those themes, those threads tie in together. Okay, so let's consider these three stories. The first one, um, look at, let me get myself oriented, look at chapter 6, verse 17. Okay, Jesus has just called his disciples to him and named 12 apostles. So that also sets the stage, right? And then verse 17, he went down with them and stood on a, what? A level place, does yours have? Yeah, like a plain, right? And so this sermon is known as the Sermon on the Plain. But look through it for a minute. We have some Beatitudes. We have love for the enemies. We have judging others. What does this remind you of? What other famous sermon? Sermon on the Mount, right? So a lot of the same content here. So, um... Which is it? Is it, did Jesus teach this on the plain or on the mount? Which one? Which one's right? Is one of them wrong? <laughs> Maybe he did both, both times. I thought it was, int I brought this up because my commentary made a point to say it could have been a plateau, be a level <laughs> place and a mountain. <laughs> but I think that I mean, we're, we might be being overly um, technical with that if we have to do that, right? Because Jesus, this is a three-year ministry, right? <laughs> Jesus taught many more times than we have the contents of the teaching recorded, right? All this time, he's walking, he's going to places, he's teaching. And so when we have a sermon presented in the Gospels, we see that this is... Um, like a, it, it's a bringing together of Jesus's characteristic teachings during this point in his ministry. And it's set into the narrative at intentional points by the author to bring out the themes, right? So what themes are being brought out by this being in the narrative at this point? Love. Okay, love. Love? And then inclusion. That inclusion, yeah, it, it comes in in the idea of love. What else? Care for the, for the oppressed, for the poor. 
care for the oppressed. Jesus starts with that. We're going to get hit those um, those beatitudes, those blessings in just a minute. Yeah, care, courage, courage. All of these things. This is an umbrella of how do you live if you are Jesus's disciple. Right? He's called his disciples to him. He selected the 12. This is how you live as a disciple of Jesus. That's the kind of overarching story of this sermon, isn't it? This is how to live as a follower of Jesus. What's it like when he's preaching? Look at those first couple of verses. A large crowd of his disciples were there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by evil spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. What is the scene like? Chaos. Chaos. Why is it chaotic? You've got disciples who are just following. You've got all these people who are ill, who are demon possessed. Okay, demon possessed people are maybe not the calmest people, right? There may be some uproar in that. It's crowded, isn't it? This is a theme in some of Jesus' teachings, right? It's crowded because the people want to see Jesus. So it's crowded and it must have been chaotic. And I think there must have been a sense of sorrow and need in that crowd. It's all of these ill people, right? Desire, yes, because they want the power, right? What's coming from Jesus? That healing power, right? And so they're drawn to it. They want it. They're needy. And so Jesus looks out at these people and says, blessed are the poor. Who are the poor? These people. These people, right? This is a blessing that Jesus offers to those standing directly in front of him, right? These are the hungry. These are those who are weeping. These are the excluded people. That's why they've come to see Jesus, right? And so Jesus blesses them. That kindness and compassion and that sense of blessing set the stage for our story, don't they? Think about, he starts out with that. That turns something you want to hear. It's an invitation you want to accept, to stay and hear more. What if he started out with judging? Okay, so yeah. so he started with the blessing, and Jesus is clearly has great compassion for these people, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Why does he even have the woes? Look at verses 24 through 26. There are woes. Why are there woes? He's truthful. Okay, what say more about that? He's saying, do this but know that. And in the crowd, there were probably people who were adversarial. I can imagine him healing and touching. He's not preaching when he's doing that. There are a lot of arguments going on, discussions of what he's just said. Okay. And uh, all of that. Just there, there are probably adversarial people. There are probably people discussing and arguing with what he's taught. How do we know that? Right? They just did it. Right? They just said, why does he eat with with tax collectors? Why is he not fast? Why is, you know, so it's happening in the stories, we surrounding stories. So we know it's happening here too, right? There are those people. This is the same dichotomy, right? That the people who say, I'm too healthy. I don't need a doctor. I don't need to repent. Those are the people. Are they going to be able to get the blessing? They're excluding. They're they're turning away from the blessing, right? It's not that Jesus is not there in front of them willing to offer it to them, but they are turning away from the blessing. The self-satisfied don't come looking. And that's the nature of these woes, right? And this dichotomy, it shows up over and over. It showed up last week in the story. It keeps showing up this week, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking poor means in me, people in me, not so much just poor, but are they in me? Are the poor are those in need. So this is interesting because um, in Matthew, I believe it says the poor in spirit, but here it just says the poor. And so I think we're looking at both, right? Those who are poor 
um, who are sorrowful in spirit, who are needy in spirit. Also, those who are poor in goods. They don't have enough to eat. They don't have enough to house themselves and shelter themselves, right? The, the actual poor. And so I think there's, you know, Jesus is speaking to both. Go ahead. Peter, who was fishing and fishing all night and several nights in a row gets no fish. His tax is reduced. Yeah, it was a subsistence system, right? There's no middle class no. really in this era. You know, we talked about this, oh, maybe in our act study where like there's, you know, the wealthy is like 1%, but then below that you don't have the big middle class that we have. You have day to day, you enough to eat for today. Okay, and and sometimes that's us, right? That we feel sorry for themselves. But it seems to me that if we're willing to come to Jesus, that he's willing to have us either way. Okay, so this, this story of discipleship, if you're willing to come, then this is how you live is a backdrop for the section. Let's look at the two healing stories in Luke 7, um, verses 1 through 17. Okay. What's the first one about? Someone summarize that for me. Who gets healed and why? The servant of the centurion. Okay, the servant or the slave of the centurion. Why is he healed? Does he ask for healing? His boss does, right? His the centurion, would this be a, gen, a Jew or a Gentile? Roman. 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 Gentile, right? This is a Gentile. But he um, is someone who must have respect for the Jewish people and the Jewish faith because he sends temple leaders to go and add, or synagogue leaders, um, and they say he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. And so out of his interest, in the God of Israel, he seeks out Jesus, right? And what what are the themes of that interaction? How would you, I, I picked out two, what, but I want, I'm interested. What are the themes of that interaction with the centurion's um, messengers? I call it a theme, but the fact that he said, you don't even need to come, my slave, you can heal him from where you're at. Okay, you don't even need to come, you can heal where you're at. What, that, what does that say? Okay, he recognizes the power, the authority, right? He says, I'm one under authority with one's under authority under me, right? So authority is one of the themes of that section. What else does that say about the centurion that he says you don't even need to come? His humility, his faith, right? A huge story of faith. And who, what does Jesus say about him? More faithful than in Israel, right? He gets a commendation for his faith. And we'll see a repeat of that faith commendation at the table today, right? So this is the this is the backdrop, right? Those who have faith can reach out to Jesus and he has the power to do the things that they need, right? That faith is a saving faith it's a healing faith it's it <clears throat> brings us into jesus's power that comes out from him right well, go I ahead sandy up here that the whole multitude just want to touch him you know that had to be a great faith just yeah yeah faith. all these people want to have have they come from tyre and sidon this is far away right they want they have faith they want to touch him yeah well i was just noticing that it was the elders of the Jews that yeah. actually came and asked yeah. Jesus, please yeah. heal him. Yeah. He's done a lot for our people. <coughs> they had to have some belief. Yeah. 
They, they came on his behalf, right? We, over and over in these stories, we see that the Jewish leadership is, it's push-pull with them, isn't it? Right? They're interested in Jesus, or why would they be there? They come and look on to Levi's banquet, right? We don't know if they go in, are they looking from the courtyard, what are they doing? But they're interested, they're drawn, and yet sometimes they resist. And so that happens over and over again. Yeah. So it seems like we've got to have that same kind of faith or attitude that we don't have Jesus around. We can go take our hill and touch his road. I mean, our faith is going to be that, yes, Jesus is there, and yes, you can heal me or heal whoever. Yeah, yeah. It's an extra layer of faith required when he's not standing in front of us. But on the other hand, we have this completed story and we have this hindsight view. And so that is something, you know, Luke has given us this as a support to that faith, right? That's it, that was his stated purpose. Yeah. And this centurion is not just any centurion. Okay. I mean, he's, he is, he values his servant. He's highly valued. Yeah. I think a lot of the centurion soldiers. Would they value any of their servants? Yeah. Right, right. And so it's, it speaks to his character. It does. And because he had faith and that he heard about Jesus and he had not dismissed him. I mean, this is not just any centurion. He would be like a standout centurion. Yes, yeah. And Jesus, I, I think Jesus, you know, uh, commends him to that effect. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Okay, so there's so we have these authority, faith, the sort of leadership of Israel, and how will they interact comes out in the story of the centurion slave. And then how about the widow from Nain? What do you notice in that story? That begins um, in verse eleven. Thank you. Nobody asked. No, there was no request. He yes, he saw her. What what would her um, plight have been like? This is a, a widow, and her only son has died. What would her plight have been? Would have been left alone. In poverty, left alone. She's left without support and without protection, isn't she, in this society, right? And so... Did you all want to make a comment? Are you sure? I'm interested. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So um, she's left without support, and Jesus sees her, and you can tell that he must have just been overwhelmed with that compassion, right? She was a widow. When the law, Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Right? She had a lot of people with her. Maybe they were, you know. Yeah, it looks like they're they're carrying um, him out. You know, this is a funeral procession. Yes, and so there are witnesses and people who are here. So yes, compassion. What else? Well, I think, you know, either way, it, it's still, she's still alone, she's still alone even in a large she's crowd. Yeah. Right. 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 They're they're right. Right. These are the people who come along to mourn with, yeah. Okay, so um, what else do you notice in this story? It just shows Jesus' compassion, but it says he has compassion. Okay, compassion, what else? Don't cry, yeah, yeah. He was moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the reaction of the people. A great prophet has arisen among us. How is this like the prophets? What prophets can you think of that did something like raise a widow's only son? 
It was both. <laughs> it was Elijah and Elisha. Yes, <laughs> you got it. Yeah, so each of them have a story of raising a widow's only son. And Nain, may, one of those is set in, in the city of Shunem. And Nain may be the site of the ancient city of Shunem. And the Nem in Shunem having given rise to the name Nain. Nain. Some scholars think that it's the same place. This idea of the widow's only son and this exact phrase in the story in Elisha in um, 1 Kings 17, 23, the exact phrase, he gave him back to his mother that is present in the text, in the, the um, Greek text of the Old Testament, the Septuagint you get the word for word phrase, and he gave him back to his mother. And so there is a sense that Jesus is echoing the work of the great prophets. And Well, I, I just had this thought that it's almost like um, a foreshadowing of when Jesus himself dies and he looks at his mother and he has that compassion mm -hmm. for her and has shot to be her son. Yeah. Know, take yeah. Care of her. That scene with Jesus and his mother at the cross, it does sort of pre, um, pre echo that scene. Yeah, it prefigures this. Again, they yeah. they really just touch something. Okay, just touch. When Elisha and Elijah raise the widow's son, they do things like stretch out on him three times and cry out to God. Jesus went up, he one touch, a touch of the coffin. And he says, I say to you, get up. And so this word is all that it takes for Jesus to raise him up. It's the power of a prophet and then more. Sure. But in some instances previous, where he didn't even have to go there. Right. It just, even the centurion, he didn't even have to go right. there. Right. Yeah. He didn't have to yeah. go there. Yeah. And they're like, oh, don't bother, he's dead. And then he wasn't, you know, because he said so. I mean, he. he yeah. Was yeah. And at that long very long. hour, his servant recovered. Yeah, we have that those stories too as well yeah and yet jesus's personal presence matters to yes. these people right and you see this remember when he touches the leper but the leper's contamination doesn't go to him instead his and we have this here the the uh uncleanness of death does not spread to jesus but life and the cleanness go back into this young man uh pam you started to say something well, you know, since they fill the ball all and they start praising God, and I think, well, was this not a big deal? Because if this happened today, we'd wow. be running away if we saw a casket, <laughs> you know, if we lived in Sully, you know, I don't think we'd be like, oh, this is not yeah, I think how big a deal was this in this day? It was a big enough deal that people testified about it to Luke and Luke wrote it down to say this matters. This is something that is true. This is shall, tells you that this truly is the son of God. So I think, yes, they, they weren't fearful. They were more all inspired or something yeah. like that. So I'm, you know, Although even Peter, in the story we started with last week, it was, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It was, there was an element of fear. So yeah, I think, I think you have a great point. Sharon. I think it's human nature. The people, when they see something with their own eyes, it's easier to believe than just hearing it and, and experiencing that. Yeah. Or, or just hearing, it. well, he healed him. So and so, well, I'll believe yeah. it when I see it. Right. Well, these they, people got to see it. They right. did get to see it, but I mean, even the disciples didn't believe without seeing. You know, all the prophets. Yeah. I mean, it's just hard as human nature yeah. to think that people want to see. They want to see with their own eyes in order to actually believe it's happening. Yeah. And but it's <laughs> where your faith comes and in when you can. Believe without being. Right. And they say, God has visited his people. Yeah. Now, some of your translations, if you, the NIV departs from the other translations and not using the literal translation, God has visited his people. The NIV says, God has come to help his people. But literally, this says, God has visited his people. And this is a phrase that runs all the way through the Old Testament. It it's used over and over to talk about God coming 
um, to rescue or to help, to take care of. And I'm, I'm gonna just, I put the verses on the board in case you want them, and I'm just gonna quickly read them to you. From Genesis 21, then the Lord, my translation is took note of, but it's visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised Isaac, right? Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely visit you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Talking about the Exodus, God will visit his people to rescue them, right? Then this is Ruth. Um, then Ruth arose with her, from the book of Ruth, talking about Naomi. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. God is coming. God is showing up to rescue, right? One more, Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you, rescue you, right? And fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place, right? And so the people are echoing these stories of old, right? They're using the words that say, God has came for the Exodus. God gave the um, child to the childless woman. God brought them back from famine. God brought them back from exile, right? And so this is a story of like, the prophecies are coming true. God has visited his people. Comments or questions on that? Uh, 2910. Okay, so last of our stage setting stories is this back and forth with Jesus and the servants of John the Baptist and then Jesus's discourse about John the Baptist, right? Okay, let's look at 718. John's disciples told him about all these things, right? He, he healed, he raised all of these stories. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, okay, why does John not come himself? He's in prison, right? John is in prison and he sends his disciples. Are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, what? He cured Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. And he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. And he finishes that statement with, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Okay, why does John need to ask if Jesus is the one they should expect? That would be my question. Wouldn't he already know? Wouldn't he already know? Is he having doubts? Is he having doubts? When Jesus says, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me, I think that is our clue that maybe John is having doubts. Why would he be having doubts? He's in prison, right? Jesus is the miracle worker, so why is John languishing in prison, okay? Also, what kind of message did John bring? How would you, what kind of descriptors would you give it? He was the ring bearer. He was, I mean, the bell ringer. He was saying, someone, the, the, the is coming. Okay, the bell ringer. What else? Forerunner, and Jesus talks about that. What tone did his message often take? Prophecy. Repent. Repent, because why? Time to change. Time to change, right? These were fiery messages, right? These were messages like the prophets of old. They have come to bring a word of judgment. They, well, he calls them a brood of vipers. He, you know, like he comes with this fiery message. And here is Jesus. I want to read you a quote from one of my commentaries because I thought it was really telling. Jesus carries no axe or winnowing fan. He cleans no eschatological, meaning end times, threshing floor, meaning he's not cleaning house. He's not, it's not the fire. It's not the fiery sermon, right? 
He burns no chaff. Instead, he cures, he frees, he resuscitates. He cares for blind, cripples, lepers, deaf, even the dead. He preaches good news to the poor. And John's growing doubt, this is the commentator's opinion, you know, had to do with his understanding of what the last days would bring for the righteous and the unrighteous. For John, it was to be a day of vengeance and house cleaning. People like Herod and Pilate would have to go. Instead, while John languishes in prison, Jesus ministers to the poor and the sick. What do you think of that? see how John, John's understanding, his vision, was more in terms of this sort of repentance and setting, you know, setting a new ethic and standard and, you know, it, there's, there, we have got to have a better standard. And that's why he marches up to that crazy king and he tells him he's done the wrong thing. This is how he gets in trouble, right? Proclaiming that the Herod has been unrighteous. He's not telling me one stop and unturn because that is the way he sees the coming of the Messiah. Yeah. I mean, that is yeah. His and does Jesus validate John's ministry and John's uh, message? Yes. Yes. It's kind of a hard resolve. But he doesn't hard do it like John. He doesn't do it like John. Each one is a prophet, but they are different prophets, aren't they? Jesus says he is a prophet and more than a prophet, right? And yet here Jesus is, and we see Jesus as a prophet. So why does Jesus answer like he does? In parables and things? Well, just right here, um, it, it's, it's kind of like that, right? But it's specifically in verse 22. Yeah, where about, you basically quote scripture from the Old Testament. Okay, where is that from? Where is this scripture from? I don't know, I was trying to find it. Is it Isaiah? It is Isaiah. Okay, okay so what Jesus does is um, tell him, well, look at the evidence. And the evidence is what was bothering John in the first place, right? It's like he's still in prison. Look at that evidence. Um, but Jesus says, look at the evidence. And then he talks about the blind receiving their sight. Now, I had you in your, um, oh, I didn't put it up here. Um, I had you compare back to Jesus's kind of mission statement um, in Luke 4. Right? Remember when he goes to Nazareth? Nazareth? Nazareth. Thank you. Um, and he stands up and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim. This is um, 4 uh, 18. Sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's from Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, 1 and the first half of verse 2. And you notice Jesus adds, the dead are raised. Why? He just raised a dead person, yeah. right? And, and so... To John, to John, that would be a clear sign. Yes. Yeah. So it's almost a correction to John because John is saying, what are you doing? He says, this is the program. Yeah. This is what we're doing. But it's so gentle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's in the language of prophecy, right? Think about so, the disciples, apostles at this point, who had been following John. So that would have been Andrew and what was the other one that was with John for two years? I don't know that. Um, I remember that it says that somewhere, but I don't know the name. One of them, anyway. And imagine their perspective on now following Jesus and having this contrast of people, you know, men, chosen men, men of God, and um, and being a little bit in awe. I mean, like, okay, this is, yeah. this is very different from what we've been following. It's very different, and yet the woes are in there, aren't they? The call to repentance is in there. And so, yes, it's different, but it also has that continuity, right? It's the same message that runs through prophecy. It's both not the, the, uh, the winnowing floor kind of scene that we get from John, but it also is. It's 
the call to repentance. It's the woe to those who won't come. That the difference is still there. Some will not come. You know, some yeah, refuse. But Dion. John didn't have radio. He didn't have TV. He didn't have a cell phone. And he met Jesus when he baptized him, but he didn't know about his ministry. He knew he was the son of God. He, he could only know what he had heard. Right. And yeah. so, you know, we talked about witnesses. He did he did personally get to be a witness to that. That's why he sent his disciples to witness and yeah. bring that information back because he, he probably was confused. Like we don't get to witness, right? right? And we rely mm -hmm. on the testimony of witnesses to know what Jesus was like. Well, and so he we're just harvesting and or sowing the seeds and we can and he did not get to really see the harvest of all that he had right. done from the right. seed. Yeah. He was not in As we don't always, right? Yeah. We don't always see the outcomes. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus draws that contrast between himself and John as well. You know, he talks about John. He says he's more than a prophet. Um, and he says, no one born of women. Is there anyone greater than John? Yet what? Verse 28. The least in the kingdom. Is the least in the kingdom is greater, right? You get to join. I'm calling you, and you get to join. And then he says, you know, we bring bring it down to verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither doing eating, eating, eating or drinking, eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a, he has a that guy. He's out in the desert, crazy. He's eating the locusts mm -hmm. and the honey. You know, like. They're complaining about John the Baptist. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, a glutton and a drunkard, right? And so Jesus comes, he, you know, he's bringing it back to that same thing. Are you going to be the person who doesn't want what Jesus has to offer? It says the many of the people acknowledged God's way was right because they had followed John. John, right? But the Pharisees rejected Jesus, God's purposes for themselves. So once again, that same question hangs in the air. Which are you going to be? Okay, let's get to our table story. Someone read for us. Um, and actually, if Judy, are you available to read? I am available to read. Would you read 736 through 50? You betcha. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who he's touching, who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. 
Do we hear so many echoes of the previous stories in this story? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy. Um, so how did this dinner come about? Look, let's look back at verse 36. Who's, how is this instigated? Simon. Yeah, this Pharisee, he wants Jesus to come to his house. He is the one who brings it up and, and invites him. Why do you suppose Simon wanted Jesus to come eat with him? Okay, I think we have to wonder that. Did he want to entrap him with a blasphemy charge or a poor conduct charge? And why would, might we think that? Because he didn't do all of those things that Jesus pointed out. That he right? Didn't even wash his feet. What well, we see his him. level of esteem for Jesus must have been very low because this would have been very strange behavior to have someone at a dinner and not provide him with a common courtesy of washing his feet. The kiss would have been a mark of affection or loyalty. So it's like water for your feet is at one level. The kiss is at the next level. Oil for the head would have been a mark of respect for an honored guest. So none of the levels did he do, right? And so we think, well, maybe he just wanted to entrap Jesus. On the other hand, we see over and over the the Pharisees are there when Jesus is teaching. They are drawn mm -hmm. to him as well. And he's the talk of the town. Maybe he wanted to know what's going on with this guy. Or maybe he just wants to find out for himself about Jesus' mm -hmm. prophetic claims, right? So he's drawing, he's asked him to dinner, yet he somehow does not manage to be even the basic level of light before the meal. Do you think Jesus knew Simon's motives or esteem of him before Jesus went. No, she found out about it, right? So I mean, did not invite the woman, right? He invites, he invites the guests he wants to have, right? It would not have been just Jesus. This would have been set up like a symposium where Jesus is in the place of the teacher but uh, there are other guests, and the woman was not among them, right? She said when she knew that he sat at the meeting, she, when she found out. When, right, she found out, and so she went there. Right, right. So Jesus might, I think, you know, um, Jesus may have known his thoughts, or it might have just been really obvious from his behavior that he wasn't that... Um, he didn't value Jesus and he in some way he was kind of an enemy right Jesus went anyway Can I ask? Sharon go ahead is this Simon Peter it is not Simon okay. Peter it is a separate okay. Simon Simon the okay. Pharisee okay. yeah yeah just to yes that's okay. good to get Thank like you. yes <laughs> so this is a, a normal custom that they would have and when he omitted this to provide water for the washing of feet is a normal custom, common courtesy, basic level for him to admit it would have been very rude. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they're lying down to eat. So they recline at the table. Yes, it's yeah. usually like head in, kind of feet out. So it's not like their feet are right next to the food, but the, <laughs> still. Still. Yeah. Go ahead. Is, is Simon the leper? and Simon the Pharisee, one in the same. Okay. You have brought us to a point that we were going to get to um, when we talked about this woman, but let's talk about it now. This story is very similar to a story of the anointing of Jesus before his arrest and crucifixion. Okay. It shows up in Matthew 26, Mark 14, John 12. But it also has some differences, right? It has enough differences that we are not clear on whether this is the same story with different elements brought out, or is it a different story, right? It occurs in Galilee instead of Judea. It's Jesus's feet that are anointed instead of his head. It's at the banquet of the Pharisees, not, not associated with Jesus's, like right before his death and burial. Right. And those stories, Jesus talks about him, him anointing his body for burial. Right. And this is way soon, way sooner than that. Right. There's no complaints of money being wasted as there are in some of these other stories. So it's a it's it shows up differently. Now, we think that Luke had Mark's account as a source. So if Luke wanted to match things up. 
he could have. So what we don't know is if it's the same story or a different story, but because we understand that the Gospels are all very carefully, artfully written literature, it's instructive to let each one kind of stand on its own and speak for itself, right? So we will take this story of Luke independently of the other traditions, which is really hard to do because we always have the other ones in our heads too, right? Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the idea, like, do we know if it's the same woman? Do we know if it's the same son? We, we don't know. Okay. So great question and I, a very long answer. <laughs> okay, what do we know about this woman? Sinful well, life. Yeah. She's good at crying because she washes his feet with her tears. That's a lot of crying, that's right? Lot of crying. <laughs> yes, yes. Very She's very... Um, Emotional in some way, maybe remorseful. What else? Repentant. What else? Well, and she's apparently wealthy enough to have a box of alabaster. She's she has this this item of value, this um, ointment in an alabaster jar. Yes, she's a party crasher, <laughs> right? Yeah. She was not. And she found out where so Jesus she's was. She must be bold, right? Or her, her her great love makes her bold because did she barge in? Did she slip in? I mean, I don't see Simon's servants as um, having, you know, the standards set by Simon. Like, I don't think they would have let her in voluntarily. She slips in. She barges in. She's something. She gets in, right? And she stands behind him. And what would this scene have felt like to be there? makes me think she's the only woman with a bunch of men. I mean, and that she probably be. is the only woman in the room <laughs> with a bunch of men. Yeah. Yeah, she probably is. What else? She's probably very off-putting. Yes. How off-putting would it be, right? It had to have been deeply uncomfortable at because here she's crying so much that it's wet and she wipes it up with her hair that's very intimate. Like all of them, the kissing. smell of the kissing, kissing, <laughs> weird, right? Like, but, and yet this is a mark of respect. This is a mark of honor and the smell of the perfume of the ointment would have filled the room or the courtyard where they are. And so it had to have been highly awkward for the attendees. Who, how does Jesus seem to feel? Does he think it's awkward? No. He isn't, he doesn't even seem to be uncomfortable, does he? Simon doesn't say anything, he just thinks, you know, he knew this was a yeah. prophet. Why doesn't Simon throw her out? Do you want to have her thrown out? Why do you think? <laughs> okay, so it may be that he would have, but Jesus allowed it, right? Well, he already is thinking, yeah, she, he doesn't know. He can't be a prophet. He can't even realize that she's this bad woman. Okay, so he may be frozen with his shock. Yeah. He's just, he's in his head. Yeah. Or he may be quite pleased that he has material to yeah. trap Jesus yeah. with, yeah. if that were his motive in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And so somehow Simon does not throw him out, but he, he, he thinks, right? Uh -huh. Um. Okay, yeah, Jesus knows his thoughts. And um, it's a stark contrast between the her value of Jesus and Simon's value. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, Linda? I have notes in my Bible from a sermon who knows how long ago that banquets like this were public affairs and people would come in not to eat but to stand around and listen to the conversation from. Important. Yes. Depending on how fully this banquet follows a model of a Greek symposium, there, yes, there, it may have been that there could have been extra people who weren't part of the banquet. And servants who are not eating, right? Yeah. And the weather is so nice in this area because I was in Greece and a lot of it is open and yeah. Sometimes the meals are taken in courtyards or in open um, areas. Yes. Simon still knows who she is. But Simon knows who she is, right? He thinks, what does Simon think? What is his main objection? That Jesus would 
real, he would know who she was. Okay, right? She's a sinner. He knows it. If Jesus were really a prophet, if he were legit, if his prophetic claims were real, he would know it. And what's his assumption? If Jesus knew it, then what? Right. Don't let her touch you. It's ew, right? He says, you wouldn't let her do that if you knew. So you must not know. And yet Jesus, let's look at Jesus's prophetic claims. What does Jesus know in that moment? What Simon's thoughts are. His claim to prop being a prophet is borne out by his knowing Simon's thoughts. Share it. Well, Simon obviously hasn't been paying attention because this is the exact type of person that Jesus hangs out with on a daily basis. Right? The tax collectors and sinners. This is who Jesus has been reaching out to. Now, do you think he had a previous interaction with this woman? Well, that's one of the things I was wondering about. They knew who she was one of her clients. <laughs> okay, I meant Jesus. I think you're saying Simon. If you're saying one of the five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so do you think Jesus had a previous interaction with this woman? Maybe in the crowd? It seems that she has already been forgiven when she comes. She comes out of gratitude and relief and love, right? So her forgiveness, it seems, we have to, we have to imagine in more than we have that we would love to know. It seems her forgiveness has already happened, that she has already had that interaction with Jesus. And she comes following that out of love, right? Yeah. Well, how, what does Jesus say to her? Yeah. Why does he say so? If she was already forgiven, why does he say it here? Maybe he's reminding her. Yeah, her tears. Yeah, her sins are forgiven. And who else might hear it? Right? For the, the benefit for so many. And your faith has saved you, right? It's such a blessing for him to speak her forgiveness of sins over her. There's a blessing for her to know that others have heard him say so. Right? And then your faith has, has saved you, right? So Jesus is not overwhelmed or embarrassed or disapproving of any of this excessive, we would call it, emotion, right? He responds with blessing. Just bless it. Everything he says to her is positive, isn't it? This woman comes with all of her pain and her sorrow and her relief, and Jesus is all blessing to her. So when we feel like, you know, are, am, I, am I too much? Am I carrying this too much? Is my grief too much? Is my sorrow too much? Is my rejoicing too much? Is, Jesus isn't at all uncomfortable, is he? He has that blessing. Yeah. And then well, also, I was just going to say, uh, I was just trying to imagine how you would have that, how you would cry like that so much. The only thing that I could relate that to is when somebody has died, that you, that you are in pain because of that loss. And in a way, her, her sins have died. She's died, you know, to the her death sins. to the old life yeah. and the birth of the new. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, what a, I keep thinking of what a relief to think yeah. that she has a the way out. The townspeople now know that she has been forgiven. And the townspeople know. Her. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, she was in a kind of life where she lived in a particular area of the city. She lived, you know, probably in the red area or whatever. <laughs> Red a red light district, okay. Okay. It's, she's probably, we didn't say this um, specifically, but I'll say she's probably a prostitute, and although adultery is possible, but probably a prostitute, right? I mean, to have that much money, it seemed like she was a woman of business with somebody, but she's now going to follow Jesus. She doesn't really have a place to live. She doesn't live in that area of town. Okay. Anymore. She's now going to follow Jesus. What is she now? What do we call people that follow Jesus? A She's a disciple, right? Right, she has been at the teacher's feet. What do we usually call that for someone to sit at the teacher's feet? 
is to be a disciple. And she has been that. And she's been commended for her faith. She is a disciple every bit as much as any of these other disciples. Right? A new kind of life ahead of her. A new kind of life. And she has been affirmed as a woman, as a disciple. Right? That's, and that's shocking. This is not what the teachers did, right? They didn't collect women disciples, mm -hmm. but, Jesus, but she, Jesus did. And we can't miss that. The fact that she has been called out as a disciple of Jesus, right? And so si we don't know her name. Well, in some of the other stories, there's a name, right? But in this story, we don't know her name, right? And if Simon says, well, if this is her, Jesus's kind of disciples, the question for Simon is, is he interested in that? Right? Is he willing to accept into the community of discipleship, right? The section began with this. this is how you live as a disciple. Is Simon willing to accept into the community of discipleship a woman, a sinner? Not just a woman, this woman. This woman, but there are more, right? We'll get there in just a second. There are more women, right? And so he has a question hanging in front of him. He has been presented as the one who loved little right what do you think this parable means to us if we have not lived a greatly a, like an obviously publicly like shamefully sinful life if we're on the simon end and not on the woman end what is this parable about loving much and loving little supposed to say to us we can still be forgiven if we that to to be to recognize our need for forgiveness is to put ourselves in as people who are willing to love more. Yes, uh, Larie. I'm just thinking because I stayed in little sins. Right. Yeah. There's it's a, a way. Well, this this big. Right. Oh, this is just like right. yeah. the it, the healthy don't need a doctor, but are you going to claim to be the healthy who don't need the doctor? Or are you willing to come to Jesus? Yeah. Are you going to be claim, claim to be the one who is forgiven little, or are you going to recognize that you are forgiven much and come to Jesus and be forgiven? Any sin separates us from God. Any sin, right? And so we have this opportunity, you know, in this parable to say, I want to be the one who loves much. And one more thing, we have the opportunity to accept the one who has come from that other life. So it doesn't look like Simon's going to take it. But how about us? Will we take the opportunity? And even all the way through Acts, we see Pharisees becoming believers, priests becoming believers. Yes, these this group of people kept being drawn to Jesus, and some of them came. Wasn't it Nicodemus who just struggled so much? Leader of the synagogue, yeah, or a Sanhedrin, member of the Sanhedrin who came to Jesus. Yes. Yeah, they, they went ahead, they said they sat and ate, they finished their meal apparently, and he's still questioning, who is this that can forgive sin? Right. What's the importance of this happening at the table? It's another inclusion in the redemption story. Yeah. yeah. We saw repentance and this sense of reconciliation. She comes back because she's from, she's already repented him, but she comes back in that reconciliation. Will Simon accept her? The table fellowship does it include everyone that Jesus includes? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, it's a call for the church. It's a call for us as communities of disciples, isn't it? Well, I just keep thinking about judging. You know, that's another mm -hmm. criticism that we, in the church, and yeah. in, this, in the Pharisees, judging. Yeah. 
we have we have being discerning and making good judgments and we have judging people like Simon does right and so are we going to do that or are we going to have the reconciliation of the table fellowship altogether we conclude today with Luke 8 1 through 3 after this Jesus traveled from one town and village to another okay he's he's on the move right and people are going with him proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God Who's with him? The 12 and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. And these women were helping to support him out of their means. So Luke gives us a list of all these critical disciples. And the critical disciples include... The twelve and these women, and this woman right? Been, this woman could have been with them. She may have gone on with them. She may have gone back to build a new life. We don't know, but this is just a handful. This is not all. This is not all, and many others, and many others. And so we see that be the discipleship of Jesus Christ includes women even in an ancient society where that would not have normally been done and in critical and important roles support roles right so if we um have lost that sense of surprise at who jesus includes you know we get to renew it again um jesus includes his maybe enemy right someone who is maybe trying to trap him someone who criticizes him someone who says he can't be a prophet jesus includes sinners he includes men and women he includes people with overwhelming emotion and they all get to come and be his disciple and it all the reconciliation of everyone is available at the table um, where they are able to include each other too and show that solidarity. So uh, last week we asked, can we be a community of inclusion? And I think this week we asked, can we be a community of reconciliation? Thank you, great discussion. Y'all are on it. Love it, love it, love it. And um, next week we're going to be in Luke 9. So read verses one through 50 for next week. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Deanna. That was wonderful. Uh, again, thanks to Mary and uh, Joyce for the lovely snacks today. Um, I know after class, are we still on for refresh to meet after class today? Yes. Yeah. So if you're involved in that, stick around. Uh, are there any other announcements? Uh -huh. We might want to remind Marie that you have the prayer next week and Dia has snacks. Yeah. I have to apologize. I set a date for all of us to go to a big, and that date's tomorrow, and this is the first time I said it. <laughs> so I called him yesterday. And I forgot so to. If you were planning to go because it was in your planner, don't drive to Georgetown. But that, that visit, we'll talk about We'll, we'll plan another trip to big <laughs> some other time. Any Maybe other minutes? closer to Christmas when we can shop. Shop, yes. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any prayer requests to add? I got one from Linda, and of course there was one for uh, Midget. And I might say I was with Mary Lou Clayton, and we have been praying for her uh, last night in a meeting, and she looks great, she feels great, and she feels like at some point, she has another echocardiogram in January, but at this point she feels like it's probably going to be a replacement valve for her heart and simple repair, but she's feeling great and out good. Just a meal and salt. Exactly. Is he down there? I didn't, yeah, he wasn't there with me. Yeah, good. Carrie Cross' mother died. Oh, really? Oh, Carrie Cross' mother died. She was born for my birthday. Can you turn off the. I don't know what happened.